Hey there, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode covers a problem I had never heard of before, and indeed was uh, shocked to find existed, suicide by pesticide consumption. I wanted to talk to Leah in order to find out more about the practical challenges involved in starting a new project to tackle a problem in the developing world, how to prove that a policy intervention actually works, and how to get policy changes implemented in a country that's very different from the one that you grew up in. Today's episode isn't brought to you by Blue Apron, the delivery service that sends you fresh ingredients and incredible recipes so you can make fabulous meals at home. If you're looking for other podcasts to listen to, can I suggest The Assassination from the BBC and Serial Podcast Season 1. Both series represent lengthy investigative journalism about unsolved murder cases. In the first, the assassination of Pakistani politician Benazir Bhutto. In the second, the killing of a Baltimore high school student in the 90s. Will either of those help you do a lot more good in the world? Unless you're going to get involved in Pakistani politics, probably not. But they're both some of the most compelling things I can remember listening to. Without further ado, I bring you Leah Utyasheva. Today, I'm speaking with Leah Utyasheva. Leah is a human rights expert and law reform specialist. She's participated in drafting legal aid, human rights, gender equality, and anti-discrimination legislation in various countries across Europe and Canada. She's worked a great deal with legal decision makers, including the legal community, civil society, and parliamentarians. And in 2016, she helped to start the Centre for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, which works to reduce the number of pesticide suicides worldwide, and which recently received an incubation grant from GiveWell. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Leah. Thanks for having me. We'll get to talk later about how our listeners might also be able to start their own uh, nonprofit from scratch to solve a problem that not many people are working on. But first, tell me about the problem of pesticide suicide. Yeah, thanks, Rob. This issue is not relatively known in in the West, but it is a major significant problem in the poor countries of um, Southeast Asia, some countries in Africa. A lot of people, out of 800,000 people who die of suicide every year, a staggering 20% die of pesticide self-poisoning. It is, as I said, it is a major clinical and public health issue, and um, It affects uh, close to 150,000 people every year. And we think that it is also a significant underestimation because uh, this issue is uh, very stigmatized. People prefer not to talk about it. There are lots of prejudices related to suicide. So if someone in the family kills themselves, families prefer not to talk about it. So this issue goes vastly underreported as well. So how large is is the scale of the problem? So as I said, out of 800,000 people who die of suicide every year, close to 150,000 people die of pesticide poisoning. So this is one one fifth of all suicides um, in the world. Wow. I've never heard of anyone killing themselves uh, by by using pesticides. Is this uh, something that only happens in poor countries or or is it just a thing that happens in rural areas? Well, mean suicide that people use differ from country uh, to country. For example, in the United States, the majority of people who decide to kill themselves do this by firearms. In Hong Kong, where most of people live in high-rise buildings, Uh, jumping from heights is the most prevalent means of suicide. In poor agricultural communities in uh, low-income countries, a big percentage of population is engaged in farming. So they have easy access to high toxicity, uh, lethal uh, means of killing themselves, pesticides. So this is why pesticides are used for suicides uh, so much more often in low-income rural communities where people, for their subsistence, they engage in farming. Mm. So this is a particularly effective mean of, means of suicide, is, is that right? So people are far more likely to succeed if they, if they have a suicide attempt with pesticides? Exactly. Uh, means of suicide that people use in, in the West and in low-income uh, countries in Southeast Asia, Asia are very different because of their toxicity. Uh, if people in, in Europe take medicine um, in overdose, uh, the lethality, the fatality of these attempts is very low. It's less than 1%. For example, if people take analgesics, tranquilizers, the case fatality is less than 1%. Less than one person out of 100 will die. In Southeast Asia or in other agricultural countries where this is happening, the case fatality of pesticide self-poisoning is anywhere from 40 to 70%. For example, one mouthful of paraquat, which is a powerful uh, pesticide, it's 20 milliliters, is highly deadly uh, with case fatality uh, from 60 to 70 percent so six out of ten people uh, will die as a result of paraquat self-poisoning wow 
I guess this is quite similar to uh, attempts in the United States to reduce access to guns because they're such a such a successful way of killing yourself, such an effective way of killing yourself that of people who try to kill themselves, if, if they do it with a gun, they, they, they have a good, sh- good shot at succeeding. And if you take away the guns, they're likely to, to use a method that actually doesn't work. Exactly, Rob. That's a very good parallel. Also, in, in the agricultural communities where pesticide poisoning is happening, people cannot get to healthcare facilities often. Quite often, it takes several hours, maybe days to get to a healthcare facility. So people die painful death because they stop breathing before they even can reach the hospital. So this is why we're working to reduce their access to this uh, lethal means of, uh, of poisoning in rural communities. I'm from Australia, and in the, in the 90s, uh, a whole lot of new gun control uh, was put in place as a result of, of, of a mass shooting. And looking back 10, 15 years later, it probably reduced the murder rate, although the murder rate was so low to begin with that it was a bit hard to tell. But there, but there was really strong evidence that um, reducing access to guns had, had cut the suicide rate by quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So not all pesticides are highly harmful. Uh, they could be, some of them are more harmful to ins- insects, some of them, some of them are more harmful to uh, weeds. Uh, so what we're working on is to reduce the access, uh, the people access to uh, most harmful pesticides, such as highly toxic pesticides. Usually, um, the WHO categorizes pesticides into four types of toxicity, one A, one B, two, and three. So class 1 pesticides are banned in most countries in the world already. But there's a number of class 2 pesticides with very high case uh, fatality, as I mentioned, for humans. So uh, we're working to reduce the availability of those. And I must say quite often these pesticides are sold in shops together with with food or other um, everyday items. So they really, really are available for, for people in crisis. And what I must say is that it's not that that these people self-harm more. It's that the fatality of the means that they use is quite staggeringly different. For example, if one person out of 200 patients dies in the UK as as a result of suicide, one in 10 or one in five dies in India. So here we're talking about the different case fatality for the means of suicide that people use. Mm. So it's not that the rate of attempts to, to kill yourself are higher in these places. It's just that people are far more likely to succeed if they try. Exactly. Of course, the rate of suicide or of attempted suicide also differs from country to country. Uh, it is not, not equal. But the incidence may be not that different, for example, in Europe than in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's estimated 350 attempts to 100,000 uh, population. However, the the fact that the people are die so much more often is is very upsetting and also i, I want to to point that it is likely that these people not necessarily want to die. Quite often, suicide is attempted at the moment of life crisis when people just don't know how to deal with a stressful situation, or sometimes it's a cry for help. It is a means of communication. So if if a suicide is more strongly associated with mental health uh, and mental health problems in, in the West, uh, it's not the same in, in other countries in the world. In other countries in the world, it may be Maybe means of communication, maybe means of coping with the, with the stressful situation. Also, it is important to know that such problems as gender violence, conflict, unemployment, financial struggles are also, child, child abuse are also strongly associated with, uh, with suicide. I was going to, to ask that. How, how do you know that most of the people who are attempting suicide don't, don't want to die? Is it because when, when they fail, they're, they're unlikely to, to try again? Exactly. Uh, re- research shows that it is uh, an imp- in, in majority of cases with pesticide self-poisoning, it is an impulsive event and people think for less than 30 minutes before actually poisoning themselves. Less than 30 minutes. And this is, of course, a, is a life-altering event. And the other thing is that Apart from low planning, it is also a low repetition event. Less than 10% of people who tried uh, killing themselves will go on to try to do it again. Of course, some, um, in some cases, uh, substitutions of means happening. Let's say if the deadly pesticide is not available at the moment of crisis, um, then someone may go and try to use a less lethal means of killing themselves. However, this is, uh, as I said, research shows that this is uh, happening very infrequently. And also what is important to note is that if people use a less le- lethal means of suicide, there is a high chance of survival for them. 
Mightn't it be the case that, that banning these pesticides could, could affect crop production or, or, are there, or are there really good alternatives and there's not much reason to be using them anyway? Yeah, we are only working on this one particular problem at the moment, and we're advocating for banning the highly hazardous pesticides. There are very good alternatives to those pesticides. We're not advocating to ban all pesticides once and for all. We, we're talking about banning the most harmful pesticides and substituting them with the less lethal substances. And those are available and those are widely known. I must point out that the United Nations and the WHO agencies are, are behind this and they are supportive of the ban of the most hazardous substances. There are a lot of uh, guidelines and uh, tools developed to find out what alternatives to highly hazardous pesticides are available and what what other substances or agricultural production methods could be used instead of highly hazardous pesticides. Right. That there's not much benefit to using these specific ones then? They're not cheaper or more effective or something like that? No, exactly. No, they may be slightly cheaper because they're older pesticides. The new varieties may be more expensive. However, the research shows that a lot of these pesticides are used in over excess. They use maybe two or three times more than, than there is a need. They use too often and they're highly hazardous, which they don't need to be. So the the total amount of the pesticide use needs to be reduced and they need to be less harmful too for human beings. So they're also hurting people who aren't attempting suicide. They're, they're, they're hurting people who are incidentally exposed near farms. Exactly, yeah, exactly. They're hurting people who are accident, accidentally exposed. There's a lot of occupational exposure. And there are also accidents such as when 23 children died in India when they ate um, a free lunch, which was cooked with oil that was stored in an empty pesticide container. Tragedies like this happen, and, and this is a cost of highly hazardous pesticide use. However, in, in our case, what we found is that means reduction is what we're suggesting. Means reduction is a highly effective way of preventing suicide, uh, pesticide suicide all over the world. So means reduction is when you reduce the access to this highly hazardous means. So if the means are not immediately accessible the, in the moment of suicidal crisis, suicidal feelings might pass before the alternative means are um, accessed. And as I mentioned before, people may use a slightly less lethal alternative and increase their chances of survival. Do you know what kinds of events are causing people to have these crises and and attempt suicide? Well, as I said, quite often it is a cry for help. It is the acceptability of using suicide as means of solving um, certain life problems. For example, if a child is having problems, a, a student is having problems at school or an old person feeling sick, or uh, a couple argues. So all this could lead to an attempted suicide. And quite often, as I said, people just need a little bit more time to think about it. And then maybe they decide that this is not a good solution to their problems. Let's talk about, about the research you've done on how effective it is to uh, you know, reduce the effectiveness of the means that are available to people. Uh, do you have any estimates of how much it costs to save a life by trying to prevent suicide? Yes. Um, so we, we're planning the, to, to do this work following the very successful input in Sri Lanka, very success, successful intervention in Sri Lanka. So this is where my colleague, Professor Michael Edelston, has worked for many years. First, he worked as a physician treating patients who self-poison, trying to save their lives. However, what he found is that this is not a very uh, effective means of uh, saving lives because quite in quite many respects, quite many cases, it could be too late and people die after a day or two after reaching hospital. Uh, however, what he found is that if you reduce the access to this means, people do not go on to commit suicide. So in Sri Lanka, the situation was as such that um, the suicide rate has increased dramatically after the introduction of highly hazardous pesticides in, into the agriculture as the result of the Green Revolution in 1960s. The suicide rate has increased from 5 per 100,000 people to 24 per 100,000 people in, seven, in 1976 and then peaked at 57 incidences per 100,000 people in 1995. So this is a staggering increase in suicide rates. And you can see a, a direct correlation with the increase in, the, in pesticide use. So when my colleague, Professor Michael Edelston, and uh, the pesticide registrar at that time, Gamini Manuvera, have noticed this trend, they thought what kind of intervention could help. 
So from 1984 to 2011, there was a lot of pesticides that were banned in Sri Lanka. So in 94, the most toxic insecticides, paraffion and methylparaffion, were, were banned. And then, unfortunately, this became substituted by less, less um, toxic one, but still people died uh, from further highly hazardous pesticides that they started using as a substitute. This, when those five other highly hazardous pesticides were banned, the rapid increase in suicide has stopped. But also another, uh, endosulfan, another very toxic pesticide has sub- was substituted as, a, as means of suicide. Uh, however, when this w- was banned in, um, in 98, uh, and further class 2 uh, pesticides were banned in 2008-2011, um, uh, the suicide rate in Sri Lanka has dropped significantly. Uh, so from 57 instances uh, per 100,000 population in 95, it has dropped now to 17. And this is a 70% reduction in suicide rate. So this is a very, very significant success. And um, this is the greatest decrease in suicide rate ever seen. So those two people, of course, there there was a team working on this. But these people saved um, close to 93,000 lives in in several years. And the estimate of the savings is quite significant. So it's maybe from 2 to $7 per dollar saved in this situation. Wow. There was a 70% reduction in suicide across Sri Lanka as a whole? Yes. Yeah. It not, not only pesticide suicides, but a 70% reduction in suicide rate uh, at all. Yeah. That's extraordinary. And, and it lines up uh, just with exactly the dates where these pesticides were withdrawn? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And this um, incredibly successful inter- interventions are mirrored in Bangladesh and South Korea, where um, the highly hazardous pesticides were banned and suicide rate has decreased significantly. Has anyone written a paper where they've tried to you know, estimate exactly how many lives you'd, you'd expect to save and, and how, how much it costs? I mean, if, it, if indeed it really costs anything other than the advocacy required by some activists. Well, of course, um, introducing this um, public policy feature will cost some, some quite a lot of money because first you need to go ahead and estimate which pesticides are used for suicides in this particular country. So here I must say, there could not be just one list of pesticides that you just decide to ban and, and this will work for every country. Each country uses their own brand names, maybe it's generic names, maybe it's different compounds, different mixtures and solutions that different active ingredients of pesticides are produced. So each country needs to do its own research in terms of what substances are used for, used for suicide. And then, of course, there will be some cost of implementing those bans. I must say that it's important to also monitor what, what substances are, are sold in, in shops because quite often there is illegal trafficking of pesticides and some substances that are not legally registered within the country may, may find their way uh, to farmers markets and, and, and shops in the country. So all this needs to be counted as a cost of the intervention. However, we estimate that um, the successful intervention could uh, could cost as much as four hundred dollars per life life saved, and this is this is what happened in Sri Lanka, and um, it could be an extremely extremely effective intervention in terms of in terms of um, cost effectiveness. Is it expensive for you because perhaps you have to lobby against the manufacturers of these pesticides? Right now, we're starting work in two countries, in India and uh, Nepal. And we exactly selected those countries because we think that uh, we could implement a highly cost-effective intervention in those countries. We have a good network due to... um, my colleagues, Professor Michael Edelston, uh, long work in the region. We have a good network of pesticide registrars that understand the situation and that are on board with, with our goals. And we also have a good network of United Nations experts who, who as, I, as I mentioned previously, have designed the cost effective and the best policy interventions to prevent suicide and um, ban uh, highly hazardous pesticides. So due to that, we think that um, we could could be effective in, in doing this in those two countries. But what we're planning to do is to first collect information from uh, 20 hospitals in India and 10, 10 hospitals in Nepal. And based on that, in, that information, we present policy choices, clear policy choices to uh, decision makers in, um, in these countries. And we, of course, will work with civil society and we'll work with other, dis- uh, other stakeholders to engage them as well. 
How do you estimate the probability of successfully uh, getting law reform in a particular country? It depends. Of course, it depends on the country. It depends on how ready the civil society is to support our ideas. It depends on how ready the decision makers are to, how accepting they are to, to their ideas. Have you generally found politicians to be very sympathetic to the cause and, and, and open to banning these pesticides? Usually, usually I would say yes, because the countries we're planning to work with and we work with now have low capacity and they have low budgets for uh, for this particular intervention. Usually there's one or two people working in the pesticide register office and they're overworked, they don't have, they have little support, they have little knowledge how to use those highly sophisticated tools that the UN develops for them. And they are very eagerly engaged in, in conversation and in in planning on how they could do their work more effective and how they can bring more good to the country. Of course, a lot more attention is currently being paid to environmental harms, uh, to um, occupation patient exposure to um uh, incidental exposure of children, residues, uh, pesticide re- residues in, in food. This is why I think this issue is so neglected because when so much talk is de- devoted to pesticide harms, people don't talk and don't know about suicide by self-poisoning with pesticides. And people don't know that this issue could be quite easily resolved with just uh, taking some highly hazardous pesticide away from the market. This is why I think this is, to some extent, is a, is a social justice and um, equality issue because people who are mostly affected by it are poor farmers in low, low-income communities who quite often don't have a voice and uh, cannot express their own uh, sorrows and their, uh, their problems. So in, in many respects, it is a call for help which, is, which has so far been unanswered. Who else is working on this problem? I'm not aware of no one else or of any other organization which which is working on this problem. As I said, a lot of organizations are working on environmental impact, occupational exposure, and so on. But it's very little is is uh, spoken and known about uh, pesticide suicides. It sounded like the World Health Organization had written some reports, but they don't really have anyone dedicated to it. No, no. Uh, There are uh, groups of people working on pesticide use reduction within the WHO and within the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. But they also do approach this from a different angle, not not like us. So our work is is a multifaceted. It is um, approaching this issue from a human rights perspective, from a quality perspective, but also, of course, from the perspective of means reduction uh, perspective, to, uh, which means taking these pesticides from uh, from the wide availability of vulnerable population. So, what we the the strategy that we are. Um, employing in this is harm reduction or harm minimization. So what this means is that instead of trying to tell people don't commit suicide, which is also, of course, is a a fair uh, fair statement, we we want to reduce the harm when people still go and try to to kill themselves. So um, this harm minimization, harm reduction strategy was developed by uh, William Hudden, who was a U.S. traffic administrator, the head of the U.S. traffic administration authority, who realized in the 60s that the traffic accidents in the United States have gone up and the fatality of these traffic accidents have um, gone up significantly as well. So what he suggested is, is a radically new approach to the problem. He says instead of telling people to stop having accidents and become better drivers, he suggested that let's uh, let's accept that traffic accidents, road accidents will happen, but let's minimize the harm from them. So instead of, you know, having the inside of the car that was a death trap previously, he decided to redesign the inside of the car. So when the traffic accident happened, it would not be deadly to a person. So he redesigned the steering wheel so it would not pierce a person uh, to death, but would just, you know, collapse and, and not inflict much, much harm to the driver. And the same happened to the uh, car hood, which became uh, collapsible and would not just cut the driver in half. So this is the harm minimization approach, which we're also advocating for. So your co-founder was initially just trying to help people directly as a, as a doctor in Sri Lanka? Yes, exactly. And it sounds like they've had vastly more impact by working on on advocacy and policy reform, like 10,000 times more impact. Uh, definitely, yeah. 
Interesting. So this is a potentially a good example of how you can have a lot more impact by trying to, you know, have have more systemic change rather than just going person to person. Definitely, definitely. Uh, law reform and policy reform are an extremely efficient ways of of preventing lots of inequality and human rights violations in the world. You know, I worked with um, decision makers and policy uh, policy people all over the world uh, on many issues. And what I found is that there are a lot, a lot of bad policies, a lot of bad policies, uh, such as, for example, preventing women with children staying in the shelters or preventing people from people who use drugs from buying clean syringes. These are bad policies, but they're so much, they're, they're developed more with, not because of ill will, they developed because people don't know better. Decision makers don't know better. They are neglig- negligent about what problems people, real people face. Usually they come from the same gender, from the same social group, mostly male, mostly well-educated, mostly in their middle ages. And they don't care about vulnerable groups. They don't care about mar- marginalized groups. However, if if they're told about the effects this, this uh, particular policy, let's say, is having on on vulnerable and marginalized groups, they they could listen. And it will be even more effective if they, they are told that it will improve the cost effectiveness of their work, if, if, you t- if they are shown that uh, their public image will be uh, better viewed by the constituency or by their boss and so on. So in the policy work, it is important to understand that influencing the decision makers go a long way if you show them the, the way to do it, which could be beneficial for them as well. Do you think that you've been very successful in getting law reform because you're among the first people to speak up about this issue? So there was just a lot of potential to reform things very quickly if, if someone actually went and spoke to politicians? It depends on the issue. On this issue, I believe that the situation will change quickly because there is a need for it to change. Because people uh, who work in uh, pesticide register offices, they know that there's a need to do it and they can see that this can be done easily and that it can be done effectively and efficiently. I believe that uh, the major problem that uh, they face is that they don't, they have low capacity, they don't have the means to do it. But of course, it could be different with other problems. When your co-founder, Professor Edelston, was weighing up, or he, he was directly treating people in Sri Lanka, uh, and then he was considering going into policy reform, was there really much question for him whether it would be more effective, or was it just obvious as soon as he thought about it that that was the, that was the way to go? No, I think it's years and years that were required to uh, come up with this particular cost-effective intervention. For many years, he worked on um, providing antidotes to people on uh, figuring which substance is more more toxic, which substance is less toxic. So there's, there was a lot of work on the personal level when he worked one-on-one with, pati- with the patients. And then uh, for a very long time, I believe he and his group worked on the social intervention, which also could be one way of solving this problem. So for a long time, the WHO and um, the International Association uh, of suicide prevention advocated, and the industry as well, advocated for the so-called safe pesticide storage. When you put uh, pesticides in in boxes and uh, bury these boxes either in the field or keep them uh, locked inside your home. So it was advocated, it was suggested that this is a highly effective solution to remove uh, the highly hazardous pesticides from the immediate availability of people in suicidal crisis. So it was said, if you lock the pesticides, then people need to go and look for a key. Maybe maybe the key is stored someone else. Maybe someone else old in the house has the key. However, this intervention has shown as a result of a long multi-year and multi-stakeholder study, it was shown that it's not that effective as, as people had thought. This study uh, had just been published in The Lancet this year. And there are a couple of significant issues uh, with with that approach. First, some people, instead of storing their pesticides in the field or in the shed, brought those boxes in their house. So it brings pesticides even closer to people. 
second, the box, even though it's locked, could be easily crowbarred and opened. And um, third, the locking of the boxes had reduced over time. And there is research showing that after several years, the locking of the boxes had significantly reduced and not, not many people actually did have them locked. And then the, the other issue is that in many instances, people bought pesticides specifically for the act of poisoning. Uh, not necessarily uh, those were the pesticides, the substances that were already stored in the house. So this was another intervention that was suggested as, a, as an effective, which actually did show that it's not that effective. So there had been a lot of research and a lot of trying different alternatives on how to uh, reduce the, the numbers of suicide. And this, the regulatory uh, means control, the way was shown to be mo more successful. And this is the way that WHO also uh, suggests to use. So uh, the, the means reduction is a very widely accepted way of suicide prevention. So in Hong Kong, I mentioned before that lots of people jump from heights. Barrier installation uh, to prevent people jumping from height proved to be extremely, extremely successful in uh, reducing the numbers of suicide. Installing platform screen doors to limit access to the railway truck also proved to be very successful in reducing uh, jumping in front of the train. And then det detoxification of gas in, in the UK, when a where a lot of people killed themselves by poisoning by gas, uh, had proven to be very, very successful as well. So it reduced the suicide uh, rate in the UK from between 19 and 33 percent. People were sticking their heads in ovens and getting gas that way? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So this, this is called means reduction as a suicide prevention and this is extremely successful in a number of in a number of ways with all suicides the same as we talked before the reducing availability of guns in the US I'm very interested to dive into this gradual research process that it sounds like Professor Edelston went through. He spent, what, 10 or 20 years uh, trying different approaches for, for preventing people from killing themselves with, with pesticides. Uh, did, did he try anything else other than the, other than the lock boxes and, and banning? No, I believe, I believe that uh, my co-founder has worked on this issue in Sri Lanka. But I think quite, quite soon it became obvious that means control is the best way of going with this in Sri Lanka because Gamini Manuvera, who, who had been the pesticide registrar, and uh, Professor Michael Ed Edelston, they worked on this in 94 uh, when the banning of pesticides started. Sorry, I, did I say 84? In 84. So I think they, they tried different different solutions to the problem in parallel. It's, and it's the, the means control one that shown to be most effective. And right now, he and his research group is, ba is working on a similar situation in, Sri Lanka, in, in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, we are thinking, we're hoping that we will be able to work in more countries than Nepal and India, uh, hopefully in, in sub-Saharan Africa and possibly in Taiwan and um, some other countries. Why did so many groups recommend that people lock the pesticides in boxes if there was so little evidence that that actually helped? And it sounds like it doesn't. And to be honest, it doesn't even really make sense to me because couldn't people just always unlock the box and get the pesticides if they wanted to kill themselves? Yeah, exactly. It seems to me that this was a solution also pioneered by the industry, that uh, a lot of uh, money ha has gone into advocating for the solution and into promoting it in the poor communities. However, um, industry must understand that if if they stop producing the highly hazardous pesticides and work on other more effective solutions, they will still stay in business. They will be still uh, highly necessary because uh, food production does need still does need pesticide to to stay in in place. They can just switch to to producing a different pesticide. Exactly. How important was it to have strong evidence from an experiment? Uh, in order to convince policymakers to, to change the law and other people to get on board with this whole project? That was extremely important. And I think this is uh, why our approach to this, uh, to the to solving this problem is also unique because we work with um, hospitals, with academic groups, um, academics on high, on providing highly precise information, on providing results of um, randomized controls trials that... Uh, point in this direction. So I think it is extremely important to monitor and to provide the best academic studies behind this. What are the biggest challenges uh, you, you face as an organization? 
well, we're a new organization and we're just getting off the ground. And this is uh, where such amazing groups as Give Well and uh, Open Philanthropy Project are very important because they help us get off the ground and they helped us to uh, to start our work. We're hoping that we will be able to provide evidence of our cost effectiveness and of our, our work so that uh, th- we have a very precise estimate on, on, uh, on the cost effectiveness and uh, tractability of, of this problem. Was it difficult to get registered in Sri Lanka and India and Bangladesh uh, to, uh, and to you know, actually get a presence there? We actually don't have a presence there yet. We, we're working with partners who will hire people on our behalf. And this, I think, is also very important that rather than be seen as outsiders, we will work with local decision makers, local civil civil society, people who are already on the ground, and we will um, engage them, give, give them the capacity to do this work themselves and maybe provide some modest means for them to do this. But it's important that we're not coming from the outside with our knowledge, but we are working with the people who are in the country, who are directly impacted with this and who are already possess local knowledge. What motivated you to start a charity specifically rather than continue operating, I guess, as, as Professor Edelston had, had been before? Now we're not only approaching this from the academic perspective, we're working from a policy perspective, from a human rights perspective, and we're hoping, as I said, to engage engage decision makers and engage uh, civil society. It goes beyond the academic research. It goes beyond randomized con- control studies. It goes more to um, working with the community in the country to solve this problem. And, uh, and the reason you wanted to start the charity was basically that you saw this enormous problem that you had a solution to that was demonstrated to work that no one else was implementing. So it was just really ripe to have an organization to seize the, seize the mantle and, and, and push that really hard. Yeah, no one, no one else was talking about it. So we thought we'll do it. Did you consider joining a different group and convincing them to, to champion the issue? No, n- not so much, to be honest with you, because we, um, we decided that it's important for us to, uh, to work on this ourselves. And rather than convincing someone else to do it, we can do it ourselves and grow organically from here. So we're hoping to have more people later on to work on this and work in more countries. But we, we are targeting a, a unique problem, which no one else in the world seems to work on. So we, why would we join another organization? We just, it's not necessary for our purposes. Yeah, you can just excel at this, at this one thing, which is your focus, and you don't have to get bogged down in a broader bureaucracy. Exactly. Would you, in general, recommend starting a new charity to people? Is it more exciting than it is scary? Well, I think it's definitely extremely exciting, and it's not scary at all. And I would definitely recommend people to start new charities if they're passionate about the, any particular subject, uh, because those are the best charities that grow grassroots and that grow from people's passions and people's desires to solve some particular problem. So this is, this is the best charities and the most effective charities that there are. Is it hard to start a charity? I find that it's not that hard to do that in the West. Uh, because all you need to do is just to go on and register a, a not-for-profit corporation. However, in, in some other countries in the world where the government do view a civil society activity with suspicion, it may be more problematic. So in, in some country, cu- countries of Eastern Europe of, or Asia, especially Central Asia, that could be a big problem, of course. However, in the, in the West, I find that it's, it's fairly straightforward and it's, it is easy. So one just needs to register um, a not-for-profit profit corporation and go from there. Of course, if one wants to re- register a charity, uh, the things become a little bit more complicated because charities need a higher oversight and there are more requirements to the board of directors of this organization and there are more, more requirements uh, to the operations side of this and, and reporting side of this. So, so you, you, you haven't found it stressful, you know, potentially worrying that you're not going not gonna to get the money that you need or you won't, you won't be able to find the hires that you need? Well, maybe all these stresses are still ahead of us, but so far we're enthusiastic that we will get through it. Fantastic. Oh, that's, that's, that's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, if any listeners are thinking of uh, starting a, a new nonprofit, it's, it's one of the paths that, that we recommend, at least if you have uh, an intervention that's demonstrated to work that, that you can't do any other way because no one else is working on it. It does seem like, uh, you know, starting something from scratch and then growing it up and, and filling a gap in the, in the market is one of the ways that you can potentially have a, have a really huge impact and solve a problem that no one else is going to solve. Definitely. I think that's, that's the case, Robert. I totally agree. Is it hard for you to work as Europeans in, in Sri Lanka and, and India? Are there, are there cultural issues that make it challenging? 
No, I don't think so. I, I think our will to um, to do well, and we're also we we're basing ourselves on very widely known best practices and uh, best solutions to the problem, and we're working with exceptional group of people in in India and Nepal who are also passionate about what they're doing. We're working with um, uh, Christian medical hospitals in India and a group of doctors in Nepal who are extremely concerned with this issue and who want to solve it or help contribute to solving it. So there, there are no difficulties. Of course, as I said, we're very cognizant on, of the fact that we don't want to be seen as outsiders and coming with our best knowledge. We do bring them the means and we suggest solutions that have worked in other culturally similar to them countries. So we believe that w- this will work. And of course, the approach will be adjusted in each particular country. For example, if somewhere civil society is more on, on this issue, is more interested, is, is more uh, prepared to take this issue on, we will work more closely with, with the civil society. If in Nepal we can work very closely with the pesticide register and to try to solve this by just taking out of out of registration several pesticides which could lead to enormous cost effective results maybe we'll go this way because we have good connection with the pesticide registrar and we are on the same page with how this could be solved do, do you get local people to go and represent your views to, to politicians directly or, or or would you go to those meetings yourself both both i think we will work with local people and we'll do it ourselves as well you're not the only uh, charity that has uh, been founded recently to, to tackle an issue that almost no one else was dealing with and was started by an academic who'd studied the issue. Uh, there's also uh, the Sister Samaya's uh, Control Initiative. Uh, do, are you in touch with them very much? We know about them, but we haven't been in touch yet. We're planning to do though. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you think that it was uh, important to have an academic as, as the founder and leader? Does that give you a lot more credibility? I think so. I think so. We we have the entire Professor Edelstein's entire academic knowledge as a background to our work. Uh, he has worked on this for many years. He has researched the best ways and he knows everything about this issue. So it gives us leverage to present our views. It, it gives him the ability to speak the same language with um, with pesticide registers, with, um, with WHO and with the FAO, um, with the UN, UN agencies. So I think it's extremely important to have an academic as a, as a head, definitely, as, especially in our case. Can you walk me through the, the process that you went through to, to get it off the ground? I imagine at first you had Professor Edelston and then, and then he found you, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And personally, myself, I was, it bothered me very deeply that after so many years working in social justice and human rights area, I didn't know anything about this issue. And uh, so, so this is, was the case also with the people I talk in, in, in Canada or, or the United States when people don't know about this issue. And this is a, a, such a significant issue which kills, which kills close to 150,000 people every year. So the only only answer that I can get for myself is that this is real an issue of social injustice and inequality where such an important issue is is overlooked by by many who are not affect, affected by it. So you had Professor Edelston, and then uh, and I guess he had the academic background and the the knowledge of the interventions and the problem, and and he found you because you were an expert in policy and, and legal reform. Yes. And then uh, did you have a lot of meetings to decide, you know, what's what's going to be the strategy? Who else do we need to hire? What, what does that what does that look like? We we worked for a long time with them online, just uh, thinking about how this will be done and how this which would be the best way to set it up. We also had a co-founder Austin Forrester, who I want to credit for his amazing job on uh, in starting this. Uh, he worked with us in the beginning to set up the charity, to um, help with the website, to help with many other things that that were very important. Unfortunately, later on, he, he quit. But yes, we worked uh, for more than a year trying to figure out how this, this organization will look. Eventually, we decided that it will be better if, if the organization was under the auspices of the University of Edinburgh, because as such, we can use resources that the university has. And we can start with very little resources in the beginning to try to channel all our resources into the countries that we work in, in India, Nepal, and maybe uh, some other countries very soon, rather than to set up uh, a big organization with fundraising sectors, departments and, uh, and media departments and so on. 
I see. So, so by connecting yourself to the university, you can use their legal infrastructure and their fundraising ability and things like that. So, so it saved you on the operations. It was good to hear a shout out to the person who helped do, uh, I guess, the, the incorporation and uh, setting up the website and all of that. I think that that, that, that could be really uh, underrated. And it's, it's not necessarily the case that because you're an academic expert in an intervention area, you're, you're able to do all of those operational things. You almost always need someone who's willing to do uh, do that difficult work. And, and that has to be done before you can really accomplish anything. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, how did you get your first uh, money? Because this is often an issue for getting an idea off the ground. You might have people who know a lot about the issue and are, and are very skilled, but but they've got no got no money, and you need to match them up with someone who cares about the issue and has money. Exactly. Here, I want to credit uh, James Snowden, who, uh, when he heard about this uh, problem, became passionate and just uh, totally engaged in the issue. So James Snowden of GiveWell have given us a lot of help and a lot of support into uh, getting the grant from GiveWell and open, the Open Philanthropy Project. So this was amazing working with him and trying to um, to understand how the effective altruism work and all the respect that I feel for you guys is amazing. You are amazing. So there are clear parallels between the academic jo- work that, uh, that my colleague has done before and the requirements and the interest that that uh, effective altruism has in into proving the tractability and neglectedness and cost effectiveness of the of the interventions of the problem so in our case it was very easy to to provide the evidence because this is how we think ourselves this is what we look for into when when we designed our strategies this is what we wanted to achieve the the precise economic value the the results of the trials and the proof that this will work uh, how will the monitoring and uh, and uh, implementation system so this all is very goes very parallel and very close to close to our heart give war was more or less the first significant money that you got then it is yeah and, and that's what allowed you to actually start the project more or less exactly exactly yes did you try to raise money from anyone else first and, and how did that go we approached the the UK different, uh, but we haven't gotten any response from them uh, so far. We're planning to do this again, and we're planning to raise more money uh, from other charities uh, for our work uh, in South, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're planning to work closely with the uh, United Nations Environment Program and the FAO to uh, to look for more money in the future. This is why we we would also like to to get help of uh, of experienced uh, fundraiser who could uh, help us approach more charities. But we also we would be happy to work with individual donors. So whoever wants to give us ten dollars will be extremely happy with that. Did Did you look around for private donors who uh, might be able to to support you and and had a passion for this issue? No, we haven't. We haven't. So if you have any, any or any of, of your listeners, Rob, has any um, ideas about how to look for f- private funders or any particular names, please let us know. That would be extremely helpful for us. Did you know how long this this grant from GiveWell is going to last you? Two years. Two years. Okay. So you've got a reasonable amount of time to, to hopefully have some success and get get some things done and then and then hopefully get the grant renewed and find other supporters. Yeah, that's the case. Yeah. There could be potential uh, donors uh, listening in, so so I might ask some questions that that they might that they might pose, or that I would think about if I was considering donating to you. One is so you've got this pretty strong uh, track record uh, where in in the past you've managed to get these policy reforms at low cost, and so you're saving lives for only a few hundred dollars. It sounds like, but how how do you know that you're going to going to be able to repeat that success? Maybe you just got got lucky the first uh, time. It's possible. It's possible. So we will see. We will try our best, and we'll see. And in we're hoping that in two, three years, we'll know if this exactly works or if it's not. Uh, however, the evidence is from several countries. It's not only Sri Lanka that we talked uh, in great deal, but the same evident, evidence comes from uh, Bangladesh, from um, South Korea, that this works and saves, saves money for as little as $5 per dollar or t- from 7 to $2 per dollar. And this is amazing. This is, this is very cost effective. So that so that's very cost effective, and uh, and if it were true, it'd be more cost effective than a lot of other things that that GiveWell uh, recommends. Uh, but but if it, if it were closer to to some of the other charities, I, I might wonder how good is it to prevent someone from killing themselves versus uh, saving a life from from malaria. So so people who uh, you know attempt suicide, their lives might be worse, and also in a sense they're they're choosing to kill themselves. They're not being killed by a disease that that that, that they did, they didn't want to have. So you, so you might think that it's it's somewhat less valuable to to prevent someone from killing themselves than than to save them from disease. And and in that sense, it would be less less cost effective. Uh, what do you think of that? 
this is this is a great point and great question. Thank you. I see uh, saving someone from suicide very similar to saving someone from a different uh, disease or from a from a different from a road traffic accident for example i don't think that's that different we're preventing harm to health and to life of, of a human being and the fact that many people decide not to kill themselves if they are prevented from 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 suicide is very telling you know those are just vulnerable people who at the moment of suicidal crisis happen to have this horrible horrible substance next to them that's why uh, th this horrible substance should be removed in close availability. Some people take a drink, but some people uh, who maybe have uh, many more stresses in, in, the, in the moment of crisis decide to go for the ultimate, ult ultimate means. So I think this, this is not that different than, than any other intervention that, uh, that saves lives and saves health. Uh, for example, saving someone or helping someone in the case of non-communicable disease will take years and years, better habits, more exercise, less alcohol or less harmful use of alcohol and such. This is extremely cost effective because you just remove the substance and the person may live a healthy life ever after and not attempt this again. So if I was considering donating to you, I might think, well, you've got this 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 great plan in theory, but are you going to be able to attract the, the staff and the skills that you need to, to really implement the, this plan extremely well? well. Uh, what, what kinds of skills do you need? And, and do you think you're going to be able to find the, the people that you need to, to grow and scale up? Right now, we, we're looking for volunteers with all sorts of um, skills. We're looking for people who can help us with communications. We're looking for people who can help us with f fundraising plans and so on. And of course, we are um, looking for people who could help us within the countries that we work in. Uh, however, I don't know if many listeners from India and Nepal are, 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 are subscribe to your uh, podcast. There's probably a few, but not a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you if you know about the problem in your own country, I know that probably people with different backgrounds are listening to the podcast. Go and uh, find out if this is a problem in your own country and see how you can help. Um, if there are any organizations working on this problem, if you know that this is a problem in a particular country, let us know. We will be very happy to engage with with people about what can be done in in other countries which may be not on our horizon yet. What kind of roles do you, do you envisage yourself hiring for in the next few years? Uh, communications, fundraising, uh, policy uh, policy work, as well as uh, government relations and um, and so on. Okay, so so let's talk about uh, your background a little bit. You're, you're doing something that's that's really challenging now. Uh, tr trying to scale up an organization, working on a problem that basically no one has worked on before. So you, you kind of you have to be pioneers and have to be quite creative. Uh, how do you think you got to the position where you're able to to do something that that challenging? How did you uh, grow your skills over time? For many years, I worked on. Um issues that vulnerable groups of people face. I worked on access to justice for women and low-income families. I worked on access to justice for people who use drugs, on access to medicine for um, people living with HIV AIDS. Migrants, recently I worked on issues that migrants face. So all my work was related to vulnerable, marginalized groups and trying to improve the social situation and human rights protection of these groups. And most of my work was concentrated on policy and on um, law reform because I have a legal background and I have experience in drafting legislation and approaching decision makers, working with with parliamentarians, judges, lawyers on, on a particular intervention. So this is what I have been doing and this is where my skills come into this particular organization that we will be able to hopefully to de design an intervention which, which is effective and which helps the most vulnerable groups. Are there any uh, roles from your past that you could talk about where you feel you were really challenged and, and you, uh, you know, get, gained, gained a lot of knowledge from, from working in it? I worked with um, human rights protection for people who use drugs and um, uh, LGBTIQ people in Eastern Europe. And this was extremely challenging because these groups are considered to be almost criminals, especially in relation to people who use drugs, definitely. They're considered to be criminals, offenders. 
And the same goes for people um, who they are called non-traditional um, sexual orientation in, in Eastern Europe, non-traditional sexual orientation. So it's um, the, the name itself says it all, of course. So it was very challenging to persuade uh, decision makers, uh, parliamentarians, to see these people as human beings and to approach their well-being, um, try to improve their well-being and to approach their human rights the same as the human rights of the majority of the population. And this kind of only reinforced my passion for working and trying to give voice to the people who don't have uh, have have it, to those people who who maybe don't even know that they have a problem. Uh, but, you know, their own way of solving their problem is... Uh, drinking pesticide so this this is why I'm passionate about this and for 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 a year now or a little bit more than a year I, I worked on this just because I just couldn't couldn't get away from th this issue because I think it's so under under reported under talked about but it's such a significant issue for for the one of the most vulnerable groups that there is did, did you manage to have any direct success in, in your previous job? So, you know, get any, any laws passed or, you know, real changes in, in practices? Definitely, definitely, yes. We passed, uh, we were successful in um, getting access to medicine for people who, who use, uh, people living with HIV in Eastern Europe. I worked successfully on improving the legislation related to visa and travel for people living with HIV because uh, in, in several countries people living with HIV uh, were banned from entering or you couldn't, if you couldn't pr prove your, no, your HIV free status, you couldn't enter, you couldn't get a visa uh, to a country. So this legislation is repealed in, in most uh, countries that, that it existed. Uh, I was quite successful in improving domestic violence legislation in Russia and other Soviet Union countries. The same with um, access to uh, justice for um, victims of domestic violence and for marginalized groups generally. You know, when, when you need to pay for, uh, for getting a lawyer or improving um, if, if someone is charged with an offense, how they can get free legal help. So I worked on that as well. And all of that and all of that experience kind of carries over to what you're doing now? Definitely, definitely. It's it's the skill that maybe I talked before that how you can approach decision makers. You need to help them understand how this will benefit themselves. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is the sad truth. But you need to show them the cost effectiveness of the intervention. You need to show them that uh, they will look better in, in the eyes of the world or in, in the eyes of their boss or something like this. Yeah. And uh -huh. then it's easier to convince them. How does it benefit politicians? It's just that they're well regarded if they do a good job? Well, differently. Um, right now, there's uh, sustainability development goals that every country needs to uh, perform. And suicide reduction is one of those uh, uh, sustainability development goals. So it's very important for the country to uh, look good in the eyes of the society, of the global society. So they need to act on those goals and reduce suicide rate, for example. Politicians really care about those international goals rather than, you know, lining their own pockets or <laughs> just looking good to their voters? Some do, definitely. Yeah, the, the best of them, I suppose, do. And then you can show them the cost effectiveness. Pesticide uh, self-harm and uh, pesticide poisoning in general have enormous public health effect on the health system. They put strain, enormous strain on the health system. And actually, I have some numbers on that. So it, it will benefit their, their um, department, their country in general. It will benefit other people who may need to go to the hospital with a different disease. But the, the very limited resources of this hospital, the 60% of them it, it, it are taken with pesticide poison patients. You know, so there's different, different levels of cost effectiveness of this. If you reduce the harm from highly hazardous pesticides, a lot of valuable resources will be freed, not only in... Uh, public health sector but also in in employment there will be more more healthy people to um to work yeah, and, and and pay taxes that the politicians can then spend i guess it also leaves um you know families and, and children in, in in a very difficult situation those pesticide suicide have enormous impact on on families and societies what are the biggest res reservations that the that the politicians have and uh, you know do, do, do your skills allow you to, to overcome those concerns 
To be honest with you, I think the, the, the worst argument against this is just that they, they have limited resources and they can't, can't find resources to solve this problem. But of course, the, the fact that you, you mentioned before that these patients are maybe disliked by both politicians and doctors because they inflict this harm upon themselves. They're responsible. They seem to be responsible for this, which are argue against this because, uh, you know, according to the international human rights law, the government, the state is responsible for protecting the health and the life of their population. So if we look at this from the human rights perspective, all these people need is access to health care. They need access to good mental health care. They need access to hotlines in, in, in the case of, uh, you know, suicidal crisis. They need to be able to access a psychiatrist's um, consultation and such. And of course, these countries have much lower resources in, in all these respects than, than uh, rich countries. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a battle for limited resources. And in, in this situation, the remo removing of this uh, ha most harmful pesticide is a cost-effective option to solve this problem. However, I must say that it's important to understand that suicide is a very nuanced and very complicated, complex um, societal, individual, uh, national problem. So much more is needed to, to solve this problem. It's not only r removing high hazardous pesticides from the wide availability of people in crisis. A strategy is needed that would improve uh, mental health care, uh, health care in general, and uh, help people cope with um, with life stresses. Also, research shows that ethical media reporting is extremely important. How you present suicides in the media is extremely important to reducing the numbers of suicide. Do you think it's partly the, the taboo about suicide that's causing this issue to be neglected because people lack sympathy for those who try to kill themselves? That could be, could be the case in some countries, could be not the case in some other countries. But definitely taboo and uh, prejudice against this plays plays a big big role definitely yeah and in some countries i must say in some countries religion plays a protective role but in others it's not so it depends it depends on the country it depends on the people on the on media reporting this, uh, as well yeah i've looked at the at the stats on uh, suicide and what seems to cause it and and it's an unusual health issue in that it seems very unrelated to, to economic issues. It seems extremely culturally specific that some countries have very high rates of suicide and others have very low. And and the main reason doesn't seem to be how well, you know, people are doing or in a material sense. That's definitely the case, yeah. If someone wanted to work on this issue of uh, pesticide suicide, are there any particular topics that you'd be enthusiastic for them to be studying or, or organizations that they might be able to, to work in first that would prepare them to do a good job? It, it's not easy to say. Uh, suicide prevention is a multifaceted problem and different fields involved into it. it, it it's suicide prevention, it's wider public health issues, environmental protection comes here also somehow, uh, reduction of pesticide use and also better chemical management in general. And it's also a question of human rights and social justice, general inequality. So you can approach this issue from all of those perspectives. I'm not a scientist or a medical doctor, but obviously one may go to study medicine, biology, psychiatry, to work on suicide prevention. Uh, as I mentioned before, my colleague, Professor Edelston, is a toxicologist and a medical doctor who many, for many years worked in Sri Lanka treating patients and saving lives. Uh, but but also studying public health, global health, in international development could be a good good areas to study if one wants to work in the in the developing countries and helping solve uh, the problems that th those developing countries uh, face. But I I think it's it's less important what what one studies. It's more important what one does with with a degree. I think it's important to study what one's like and what you feel good about medicine, mathematics, law, whatever is, that is. But if you, if you think about vulnerable groups and vulnerable population, non-majority groups, how, how you can make your degree work to help these this groups, to give voice to the groups that usually don't have a voice. And this, this can be done in any country, you know, in, of course, even in, in high-income countries such as Canada, the United States, the UK, there are lots of people who need help. However, of course, one can uh, help many more people in developing countries with interventions which will be much more cost-effective. 
Uh, so, so what did you study? I studied law in Russia, and and then I did a comparative constitutional law and human rights law, which I studied at Central European University in Budapest, and later on in the UK and at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. How did you find uh, law as a as a student? Uh, did, were you, were you, was it was a good fit for you? No, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it wasn't a fantastic fit because it was a little bit too dry and too devoid of real life problems that made me passionate. So that's why I went into into human rights and into social justice work, because I found it a little bit dry to work on contracts or to work on mergers and acquisition documents and such. So this is why I work, I work on legal issues or policy issues that are related to uh, to law. And this is what I find fulfilling and interesting, because here you can see the difference. Of course, it may take a while, but you can see the difference that your efforts has made, and hopefully the improved lives of, of people. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to say that uh, some of my work has resulted in improve, improving life of the vulnerable and margin, marginalized groups. Uh, what's the biggest downside of working on pesticide suicide and I guess some of the other human rights work that you've done before? I would say uh, generally about human rights. The downsides are probably the fact that it's not very well paid. And the other thing is that it takes a long way to, in, in many respects, it takes a long way to, um, to really see the change. Uh, hopefully this issue will be different and I'm, I'm hoping very much that this, this will be the case because hopefully we will see the results of our intervention quite early on. For the two years, we will just work on on setting up the the system that we we think hopefully will work. But for the next maybe two four years, we we're hoping to see the results of our intervention. But usually, it is the fact that it's it takes a long a long time to uh, really um, achieve um, a change in in the public policy. I thought you might say that the biggest downside is that you're working with, you know, very uh, grim problems and difficult problems, especially if you're thinking of, you know, homophobia in, in Eastern Europe or people people who are who are killing themselves. Uh, is it very draining emotionally? No, no, I would say no, because you work with amazing people. You work with amazing people who, who are drug users, just happen to be drug users. They just happen to live with HIV or they happen to experience domestic violence. It doesn't make these people sad or it doesn't mean that these people are you know any any different from other people uh, quite often you actually learn a great deal from these people the resilience they have the the amazing will to live and to um, to be happy still despite all the problems that they face and i i think it's the same with the with suicide victims it's not that they're sad or that they're desperate it's quite often it is of course some people with mental health issues are sad but not always they're not always sad and as i said a lot of people who kill themselves or try to kill themselves in southeast asia and other low-income countries do this in the moment of suicidal crisis and they're amazing people apart from that of course, understanding the extent of this problem and understanding the the human cost of the high, wide availability of pesticide is grim and sad. But this is why this is what gives gives me passion and what gives me enthusiasm to inspiration to work on this issue. That it is possible to solve this and it is possible to improve the lives of of these people by a great deal. Well, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's, it's going to be very interesting to hear how uh, the charity matures over, over the coming years and what kind of results you, results you manage to get. Hopefully, we can talk about it again uh, um, in, in a couple of years once you've had, a, had some more experience and hopefully are, are a whole lot larger. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. My guest today has been uh, Leah Utyasheva. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Leah. Wonderful. Thank you. On the 80,000 Hours site this week, we released a detailed guide to a new path we recommend for having a large social impact, becoming a China specialist. We also wrote about opportunities to earn to give in law in the UK and why we typically don't recommend them. You can find both of those on our blog at 80,000hours.org slash blog. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.